Hi everyone, welcome to The Enthusiastic Buddhist. In this episode, I want to talk about the Noble Eightfold Path, which is part of the Four Noble Truths. In my last episode, I covered the Four Noble Truths, so I'll put a link to that episode up here in case you missed it and you'd like to watch it now. So I ended the previous episode talking about the Fourth Noble Truth, which explains that if we want to reach enlightenment and be free of all suffering, we have to follow and practice the path called the Noble Eightfold Path. So in effect, there are eight things that we need to train in. The Noble Eightfold Path comprises of eight different aspects about ourselves that we need to monitor, practice and perhaps change to ensure that they're in line with our spiritual aspirations, which are presumably to lead a moral life based on compassion and wisdom. So the Buddha summarized the eight trainings in the Noble Eightfold Path. There are two trainings in wisdom, three trainings in morality, and three trainings in meditation. In the Pali language, these are known as Pana, Sila, and Samadhi. The first of the eight is right view. Right view is also known as right understanding, and it comes first in the sequence of eight because it acts like a core principle that guides the seven other trainings. In the beginning, right view helps us to steer our behavior towards cultivating wholesome actions, which helps direct, direct us towards peace and liberation rather than further from it. Then in the end, right view is representative of the wisdom that we gain from our meditation, from our meditative realizations. And this only comes as a result of having practiced the seven other trainings. So right view is important in the beginning, middle and end of the path, all the way up into enlightenment. Right view is perhaps the hardest for beginners to understand and practice. So I'll come back to it at the end of this video and go over the seven other trainings first. The second training of wisdom is the practice of right intention. The Buddha explained right intention as having the intention of renunciation, the intention of goodwill, and the intention of harmlessness. Having an intention of renunciation. One way we can look at this is that it means our intentions our intentions should be more selfless rather than selfish. And so we're not motivated by personal greed so much. In, in fact, we're renouncing selfishness. Practicing more selfless behavior helps us to move away from fortifying our own egos and always coming from a place of self-centeredness. Instead, we need to rec recognize that everyone is in the same boat as us in wanting happiness and avoiding pain. So we should try to live in a way that helps the majority instead of trying to, sec trying to secure the happiness of just one being, you know, the separate self, this individual I. The Buddha taught that we're all interconnected. So renouncing selfishness and selfish pursuits and working towards the, the greater good is considered more in line with true reality and than what we might first realize or appreciate. Intention of renunciation also means living a life more inclined towards peace and letting go. Renunciation doesn't necessarily mean becoming monks and nuns and renouncing our families and living in a cave to meditate. It could mean that, but mostly it means renouncing our greed, our anger, our jealousy and other harmful emotions. The Buddha said that he who has renounced his impurities is called a renunciant. So the impurities we're seeking to renounce are our mental impurities or defilements of greed, aversion, pride and jealousy, which all arise from ignorance and selfishness. And why do we try to remove these? Why do we try to renounce these? Because they cause us so much pain for ourselves as well as others. Intention of renunciation also means letting go of the belief that happiness is to be found in things that are external to us. I mean, society tells us that happiness is to be found in, in acquiring more and more things. Yet the Buddha taught that happiness isn't found in external objects and their acquisition or through increasing our craving and desires, but through finding the inner happiness that is within us instead. 
So having an intention of renunciation means we slowly loosen the grasp of our craving and attachment to external things so we can start to find the peace and happiness that lies within our minds, which we can find through the practice of meditation and mindfulness. Now the next one is intention of goodwill. Having an intention of goodwill means we should act with the attitude of goodwill and love as opposed to ill will and anger. Our actions of body, speech and mind should, be, should resonate with the wish to help others and make them happy. Anger is something that affects us all in various degrees. If we do have anger or ill will towards anyone, then the Buddha prescribes the meditation of loving kindness to help us eradicate these tendencies of ill will or anger. It's said that our mind's true nature is one of love, peace and wishing others happiness. So it's this state that the Buddha wants us to tap back into. The last part of right intention is the intention of harmlessness. Having an intention of harmlessness means we should be motivated by compassion and not wanting to cause or increase the suffering of others. This means we refrain from harming others in any way, such as through physical violence, verbal abuse, mental manipulation or power games. Actually, the, this intention of harmlessness should be employed in anything and everything that we set out to achieve. We should always carefully consider the, consider the ramification of all our actions to ensure that it doesn't cause harm or suffering in any way to any living creature. The next three trainings in the Noble Eightfold Path are the three trainings in mor of morality. These include the practice of right speech, right action and right livelihood. In essence, we try to practice these because it helps us to have a mind that is kind, open and free of discursive thought. And this allows us to achieve deeper levels of concentration when we meditate. We cannot become enlightened unless we meditate, but we cannot meditate if we're constantly creating unease in our minds. So the three trainings in morality help create a building block or stable foundation for our meditation to be supported on. And this in turn allows for realizations and greater wisdom to occur. And remember, these practices of morality are also motivated by right intention, the training which came before these. So you will notice that these trainings of right speech, right action and right livelihood are geared towards acting out of compassion and refraining from harming, causing harm towards others. So the first is the practice of right speech. The Buddha advised us that right speech means not lying, not engaging in slanderous or divisive speech, refraining from abusive or harsh, harsh speech, and refraining from idle gossip or chatter. Instead, our speech should be truthful, kind, beneficial and full of love. I actually want to devote an entire video to right speech because it's such an important topic I mean, how often do we say things that we later regret or we wish we had some guidance, guidelines as to what we should say and when? So I'll cover this topic in another video in the near future. The next training in morality is the practice of right action. Right action means to avoid killing, stealing and sexual misconduct. Sexual misconduct basically refers to being unfaithful to our partner or sleeping with someone else's partner. Although these trainings of killing, stealing and sexual misconduct are singled out in this training, right action really means that we should avoid any, any behaviour that harms others and in, instead we should perform virtuous deeds motivated by compassion, kindness and generosity for instance. Now the reason the Buddha brought our actions into the spotlight is because the Buddhist path is a path of training our minds towards wholesome and virtuous habits. If we repeatedly engage in killing and violence, stealing or being unfaithful in relationships, it's going to strengthen these unwholesome mental factors or defilements in our minds until, we become, until they become dominant and natural patterns of our thought and behaviour then in the future we'll more easily do non-virtuous things without giving it a second thought. Now at the moment we might not kill other sentient beings out of violence or wishing them harm, but we do strengthen our disregard for the suffering of others every time we take the life of another. 
And if we want to cultivate a mind of compassion and love, we have to refrain from behaviour that's antithetical to this. Taking another being's life is not compassionate, as it takes away the very thing that all beings value most, which is their right to live and breathe. The Buddha said, In this matter, the noble disciple reflects, Here am I, fond of my life, not wanting to die, fond of pleasure and averse from pain. Suppose someone should deprive me of my life. It would not be a thing pleasing or delightful to me. If I, in my turn, were to deprive of his life, one fond of life, not wanting to die, one fond of pleasure and averse from pain, it would not be a thing pleasing or delightful to him. For that state which is not pleasant or delightful to me must not be pleasant or delightful to another. And a state undear and unpleasing to me, how could I inflict that upon another? As a result of such a reflection, he himself abstains from taking the life of creatures and he encourages others so to abstain and speaks in praise of so abstaining. And in another sutra, the Buddha said, The disciple, abstaining from the taking of life, dwells without stick or sword, conscientious, full of sympathy, desirous of the welfare of all living beings. In Buddhism, we use the term sentient beings quite a bit. Sentient beings are said to be any living creature that has a consciousness and can feel and perceive. So in this, we include animals and even insects. For those of us who love animals, we can see that animals have emotions and they are worthy of our love and respect. But for some of us, it might be a bit harder to appreciate that insects have their own consciousness too. But why not? I mean, if we try to kill an insect, they will try to run or fly away. So surely they perceive danger, feel threatened and they react to this. I remember when I was on my retreat, doing one of my retreats and one day I was walking up the hill and I saw this caterpillar that was rolling down the hill and it was covered in bull ants and which were biting it. And it looked to me like this caterpillar was writhing in pain and really fighting for its life. I mean, if it wasn't sentient, wouldn't it just lie there and let the ants kill it and devour it? But even if we don't believe that insects are sentient, can we really feel proud of our actions if we consciously take the lives of those that are so much smaller and weaker and more vulnerable than ourselves? The Buddha highly praised anyone who abstained from killing. He said, he who has renounced violence towards all living beings, weak or strong, who neither kills nor causes others to kill, him do I call a holy man. The Buddha really stressed the importance of living a life of non-violence and compassion. Not only did he include not killing as part of the Noble Eightfold Path, but he also made it the first Buddhist precept or vow taken by a lay person or an ordained monk or nun. Of course we cannot eliminate all killing, like the accidental killing of ants when we walk. One of my teachers pointed out that we, we would need to be like suspended in space if we wanted to prevent all killing. But the most important thing is our attention and intention. We need to examine how aware we are whenever we do things, like checking to see whether our actions are, are possibly causing the death of another. And we should check to see what our intention was if we did cause the death of another. Did they die as a result of our malice or because of our desire for entertainment? What is important is that we consciously choose to refrain from actions that cause suffering to others. If we want peace in the world, it has to start with ourselves and our actions in the world. The Buddha said that all beings have been our mother or our father in our past lives. Now I can't verify that for myself, but I took this teaching and decided that every time I came across an animal or insect or even other human beings, I would mentally name them mum. So if I saw a spider, I'd mentally greet them, hi mum. <laughs> if I saw a dog, I'd think, hi mum. If I was served by someone at the local shops, I'd think, thanks mum. Now, the teachings don't just point out that what we shouldn't do, but they also encourage us to do the opposite. So in the case of taking life, we should practice the opposite and save lives. So whenever I could, I would save the lives of insects drowning in the toilet or caught in the spider's web or move them off a bike path before they got run over or stepped on. 
And over the years, these two things, mentally calling other beings mum in my mind and saving lives, has made it impossible for me to knowingly take the life of another creature now. No matter how much I might disdain ants when they invade our kitchen or hate cockroaches in the house, I won't kill them. I'll find an alternative to removing them. I literally can't kill creatures with my own hands. And this didn't always used to be the case. I used to kill, I used to kill insects, especially mosquitoes and, and spiders, and I also used to go fishing. But through mindfulness of my intentions, which came through meditating, I realised that I killed insects out of fear and aversion, which I don't think is a just reason for killing something. And I used to fish because I was drawn to the peace and serenity of being by the lake. And it was nice to share that space of peace and silence with the friends that I fish with. But now I can get that same payoff when I meditate with others and no one has to come to any harm. If we really want to walk the path of peace, we need to examine our relationship with this idea of non-killing and compassion. But ultimately, whatever we do, the thing that matters most in every situation is our intention. And this is just as important when it comes to the next training, the training of Right Livelihood. Right Livelihood makes up the last of the three trainings in morality. Because we spend so much of our waking hours at work, the Buddha wanted to ensure that our activities there were also in line with living a kind and compassionate life. The Buddha explicitly said there are five occupations that we should avoid. He said, Monks, a lay follower should not engage in five types of business. Which five? Business in weapons, business in human beings, business in meat, business in, in intoxicants, and business in poison. These are the five types of business that a lay follower should not engage in. So business and weapons refers to selling guns or weapons that can cause the death of others. Uh, business in human beings refers to slavery or prostitution. Business in meat refers to working as a butcher or in a slaughterhouse. Business in intoxicants means selling alcohol or illicit drugs. And business in poison could mean manufacturing or selling poison to kill insects or animals. So you can see these livelihoods directly or indirectly cause suffering in some way to other beings. So they're ones that we should try to avoid. And also when it comes to practicing right livelihood, it's not just about the actual occupation that's important, but how we conduct ourselves in our business. For instance, it's important to avoid scheming, deceit or trickery in any of our business dealings. So these three trainings of morality, right speech, right action and right livelihood, encourage us to act in, a virtu in virtuous, honourable and peaceful ways in the world. Morality is the foundation or basis of all spiritual development. If we live a virtuous life, we won't have any regrets or guilt or worry and our minds will be less scattered or full of discursive, unwholesome or unhelpful, unhelpful thoughts. Then when we come to the cushion to meditate, we will be able to meditate much better because our minds will be open and carefree. And then it's just a matter of disciplining ourselves to meditate on a regular basis so that we can move through the stages of meditation to reach a special insight, which is realizing the true nature of our own mind. Which brings us to the next three trainings, the three trainings of meditation, which include the practice of right effort, right mindfulness and right concentration. The practice of right effort has four parts. These are the effort to prevent negative mental states from arising in our mind, for example, preventing anger or jealousy from arising, the effort to abandon any negative state of mind that has arisen, the effort to cultivate positive mental states not yet arisen, such as cultivating compassion in our mind, and the effort to maintain these wholesome states of mind that have arisen. These trainings are what really make Buddhism shine in my opinion. None of us want to experience negative states of mind such as anger or ill will towards another. And Buddhism has many different techniques for helping us eliminate these states of mind 
and preventing them from arising in the future. And the meditations of loving kindness and compassion are all about cultivating positive mental states and maintaining them. I'm going to be doing some videos on these meditations in the near future and actually I want to devote an, another future video just to the practice of right effort so I can go into the more detail about these four. So the next training is the practice of right mindfulness. If you've been following my website you would have seen that I've been writing a fair bit about mindfulness lately. Anyone would have thought that I'd covered this topic thoroughly enough by now <laughs> but actually I've been saving the best bit for last. And that is how mindfulness is such an important tool for cultivating an awareness of our thoughts and how this assists us in and out of meditation. There's also the importance mindfulness plays in strengthening the quality of our concentration, which ultimately improves our meditation. So because the, this is quite a big and important topic, uh, I'm going to again dedicate this to another future video. The last of the trainings in the training of meditation is right concentration. Right concentration means we train our minds to be one pointed and focus when we meditate in order to achieve a concentrated mind known as Samadhi. Samadhi is a very pure state of consciousness and awareness. In the state our mind can stay fixated on a meditation object without wavering and it experiences a calmness and stability that we would find hard to comprehend at the moment. If we continue to meditate in this intensified state of concentration it will help us to it will, it will lead us into, into the jhanas uh, which are necessary states of meditative absorption that we must pass through in order to gain special insight and become awakened. Now getting back to the training of right view. Right view ensures that our behaviour, speech and thoughts are being born from a mind that is infused with wisdom and compassion and that our behaviour is in line with these principles. So what does wisdom mean here? It means having an understanding of the true nature of reality and seeing things as they really are. It means we have penetrated the Four Noble Truths and seen the truth of them for ourselves. Since the Four Noble Truths are directly tied into right view, I'll quickly recap on its importance and how it relates to, right under our, how it relates to our right understanding of the world. As I explained in my previous video, understanding the first noble truth means that we recognise that all phenomena are impermanent and unsatisfactory. We can see that no matter what happiness we find in our daily lives, it isn't everlasting and it cannot pro provide constant satisfaction. Instead, we're always left with this feeling of wanting more, wanting more happiness and pleasure while we do everything we can to avoid pain. And it, it's this craving for happiness, as outlined in the second noble truth, that, that drives our behaviour and ultimately our dissatisfaction because we aren't able to feel absolute contentment in what we have at the present moment. But if we examine carefully, we will notice that, that, that there are moments when we do feel, experience great peace and satisfaction. These are times when we're completely content, content in the moment and we're desiring absolutely nothing more or different. Like when you're sitting by the lake on a nice spring day and you feel so content as if you could just sit there forever. There isn't a trace of craving in your mind. Or when you're, you've been desiring after something or someone for so long that it's literally like consumed your waking life and just one day you decide to drop it and let it all go and you suddenly feel this immense peace, spaciousness and satisfaction. That is the third noble truth being brought into action. And the fourth noble truth is the practice of this Noble Eightfold Path. So by practicing the path of morality and meditation, we will start to see how this really is a path, path to peace and happiness. And then our faith in the fourth noble truth will be ignited. It can take time to really appreciate the Four Noble Truths at a heart level. But if you want to try and internalise this teaching a little bit more, you might want to try this exercise. Next time you find yourself experiencing some suffering, 
look deeply at what the underlying lying craving might be. What is the craving that's not being fulfilled here? Is it our craving for love, attention, praise, validation? Whatever it is, once you've recognised it, we can then employ wisdom and compassion to let it go and through this we'll begin to experience true peace. But meanwhile, if we're still struggling with the Four Noble Truths, we can still practice the seven other trainings in the Noble Eightfold Path. And I should also mention that Right View isn't restricted to simply understanding the, fourth no the Four Noble Truths. It also incorporates an understanding that not only is all compounded phenomena impermanent and unsatisfactory, but that it's also empty of inherent existence. Again, <laughs> this empty of inherent existence is something I'll go into more detail in another future video. And lastly, right view means having a correct understanding of karma and appreciating that all actions have karmic consequences, meaning that wholesome actions lead to favor favorable results and unwholesome actions lead to negative results. So in brief, right view consists of understanding the relevance of the Four Noble Truths the role of karma, and realising the nature of phenomena as being impermanent, unsatisfactory, and without a permanent or inherent existence. As I mentioned before, right view is perhaps the hardest of the eight of the Noble Eightfold Path to understand and practice. Whereas the other trainings, such as right speech and right mindfulness, may seem <laughs> much more straightforward and practical. Again, don't worry if it doesn't all make sense to you at the moment. I'll put links below to some ebooks that you can read more about the Eight Noble Eightfold Path. My explanation of it is only one way of presenting these teachings. So before you either agree with them or dismiss them, I highly recommend that you do a bit more reading about the subject. So in summary, these trainings are really inviting us to embark on a big adventure, to know and un understand the workings of our own mind to become aware of our intentions and how to live peacefully and compassionately in the world. These trainings are the first steps towards up uprooting unwholesome and harmful states of mind and instead cultivating qualities in ourselves that we probably admire in others. By coming to know the psychology of our own mind, we'll slowly start to see that we are the creators of our own happiness. And by practicing the Noble Eightfold Path, we'll find that it's a path of self-purification of our minds and a path that will lead to realisation, awakening, freedom and happiness. And so that's all from me. I hope this video wasn't too long. <laughs> As I said, I'll be covering some of these topics in greater detail in future videos. So please subscribe to my channel, please like and share this video if you found it helpful. Leave me a comment below and check out my website enthusiasticbuddhist.com for more information on Buddhism and meditation. So have a great week everyone and I hope to see you in the next video.